It appears to me that we have our hands in the monkey trap. A monkey trap is a gourd or a cage or a disco ball, apparently, though I've never really thought of it that way before, with a hole in it. And the hole is just large enough that a monkey can reach its hand in if it squeezes its fingers together. But if there's a piece of fruit in there, the monkey grabs the piece of fruit and it can't pull its hand back out while it's hanging onto the fruit. And as it turns out, the monkey won't let go. It sounds ridiculous. You catch a monkey so easily. For monkeys, we have our hands in the monkey trap. The monkey trap is the low-hanging fruit of industrial civilization. It's the lights that come on when we flip the switch. It's the water that comes through the taps when we turn on the water. It's the, it's the gas at the service station when we drive up every single time. It's the food at the grocery store every single time. You can't let go. We have our hands in the monkey trap. Philosopher, writer, Albert Camus said, this is a guy who won a Nobel Prize in 1957, that the only way to deal with an unfree world is to become so absolutely free that your very existence is an act of rebellion. And almost everybody I talk to in this country thinks that we're free. Big energy poisons our water, big pharma continues to poison the water, therefore controlling our behavior. Big ag controls the food supply, big banks control the flow of money, big ad controls the messages we receive by the thousands every day. Through it all, most Americans believe we're free. Really? Try to secure your own water supply, see how the government deals with that. It won't be favorable. Florida is the most recent state to take draconian action against people who want to live outside the system. Less than a month ago, making it illegal to live off the grid. Repeat after me, Americans, we're number one. The only way to deal with an unfree world, and I would argue that we're in one, is to become so absolutely free that your very existence is an act of rebellion. So, this is a signpost for me. I pursue freedom. Almost nobody likes it. I like to finish with some really good news, so here's some. Really good news, you get to die. DNA assures our incredibly unique status. The odds against any one of us being here based on our understanding of DNA exceed the odds against plucking a single atom at random from the entire universe. You're a miracle, and I don't even believe in miracles. The odds against any one of us being here far exceed the odds against winning the lottery every week for a year. And yet here we are. As evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins points out, in the teeth of these stupefying odds, it is you and I that are privileged to be here, privileged with eyes to see where we are and brains to wonder why. More good news. There's no blame. It's clear that we've triggered runaway climate change. It's clear that we're driving to extinction several hundred species every week, and that at some point that species becomes us. The vanishing point draws nearer every day. It's clear that we can't live with a thriving, living planet. And we're killing everything. But it's not your fault. We were all born into captivity. We were born into this set of living arrangements. We take great pity on animals that are born into captivity and never, ever manage to get out of the wild. Oh wait, that's us. In the last several thousand years, there have been essentially zero human beings who have managed to get out into the wild. We're born into captivity. Most people can't see the bars. As Goethe said some 200 years ago, none are more enslaved than those who falsely believe they are free.
no blame and no judgment either. There's a tremendous lag between cause and effect with respect to carbon dioxide emissions. It's about a 40 year lag from when the carbon dioxide is kicked up into the atmosphere and the temperature rises as a result. 40 years. What did you know 40 years ago? Three quarters of the people in the room weren't alive yet. I was 14. I had just learned to drive a car. And man, was I looking forward to tearing it up. I didn't know, we didn't know, that the consequences of our actions would be so delayed as to make action, positive action, essentially impossible to pursue. And so now, we've triggered the kind of temperature rise exhibited in this wheelchair that has replaced the hockey stick of Michael Mann. We're a funny species. And, lest you despair, and apparently some people do when I give them the good news, that they get to live, and therefore die. I, I take into account the words of Edward Abbey, the iconoclastic writer from Tucson, Arizona, from many years ago, action is the antidote to despair. Even if it's too late to turn this ship around, especially if it's too late to turn this ship around, what better judge of our character than, by, than, than what we throw into the abyss when the abyss draws near? Anybody, anybody, can cheer for the favorites, and most of us do. How about not only cheering for the underdogs, but becoming the underdogs? Taking those actions that might sustain and increase the joy of other people and non-human organisms at this most fascinating time in our history. Probably the best known, the best studied self-reinforcing feedback loop is the one Paul Beckwith studies, and that's um, methane coming out of the Arctic Ocean. So methane has been bubbling out of the Arctic Ocean. That was reported in August of 2009 in Geophysical Research Letters that there were 250, about 250 plumes of methane hydrates escaping from the shallow Arctic seabed. And that was likely a result of a 1C rise in temperature regionally. So it doesn't take much of a rise regionally that is in the Arctic to cause the hydrates or class rates to start coming out of the ocean. And that's because those hydrates or class rates, those are synonyms, and, and those are chemical cages. The class rates are, are chemical cages around CH4 molecules or methane molecules. And it doesn't take much to, to warm them enough to release the methane out of the hydrate because they're at relatively shallow depths in the Arctic Ocean, as shallow as about 50 meters and perhaps all the way down to 700 meters or so. Because of um, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we have greatly warmed the planet, including at depths in the ocean down to 2,000 meters. So it should be no surprise that we've warmed sufficiently in the Arctic to cause the class rates to start bubbling out of the Arctic Ocean. There's been a bunch of research done at this point on the methane coming out of the Arctic Ocean, including NASA's CARVE project, which in mid-July of 2013, mid-July of last year, reported several plumes up to 150 kilometers across. According to uh, Natalia Shikova, also that same month, July 2013, um, she did an interview with Nick Breeze and reported really, really high levels of methane coming out of the Arctic Ocean in a wide variety of places. And so that's the, that's the best studied and probably the most worrisome of the self-reinforcing feedback loops is methane coming out of the Arctic Ocean. And when we look at atmospheric levels of methane for the whole planet, it's pretty clear that they've gone exponential since about 2007, almost certainly as a result of that methane coming out of the Arctic Ocean, which is the really sensitive 
um, worrisome place in terms of methane. Some people, some people like to share this information and others don't. I talked to somebody yesterday who was at the presentation last night. They got into a cab and immediately they assaulted the poor cab driver. Guess what I heard? And the cab driver is like, you can get out here. No, you don't owe me a thing. Just leave. I mean, I can only imagine the poor cab driver. So, so one way that you might want to start this conversation is uh, there's two kinds of people in the world. People who think there's two kinds of people in the world. And Oh, no, that's not right. If, if there's an asteroid about to strike the Earth and astronomers know with great certainty that the asteroid is coming and it's going to hit Earth and it's almost certainly going to destroy all habitat for humans. And so there's people who want to know. People who want to know exactly the second the asteroid is going to strike. And then there's other people, they don't want to know a thing. I just want to go on my, with my life the same as I've been doing. I don't want to know about any stinking asteroid. So you might ask people, oh, which kind of person are you? Do you want to know about the asteroid or do you not? Because climate change is the asteroid. Civilization is the asteroid that is aimed right at <laughs> human habitat. And so some people don't want to know. That's okay. I got no problem with that. Okay, that's a lie. If anybody sits next to me on the airplane and they open the door to talking about abrupt climate change, I'm all over it. And by opening the door, I mean saying hello. <laughs> hello? What do you mean, hello? Do you mean abrupt climate change? It's an acronym, isn't it? Thanks for bringing that up. The best I, advice I have for anybody at any time comes from the Buddha more than two and a half millennia ago. The trouble is, you think there's time. Seize the day. To quote Nietzsche, live as though the day were here. To live every day. To live here now. To be here, to be present, to be fully present with wherever you're at. To spend time with people that you enjoy spending time with. To try to make the world a better place, but don't get too attached to the outcome of the world becoming a better place. My entire life, I have heard that the world has been better and better. We have smartphones, after all. But every year of my life has been worse than the year before. Every year we have more dirty water than the year before that. Every year we foul more of the air than the year before that. Every year we wash more of the, of the soil into the world's oceans. Every year we ratchet up carbon dioxide. Every year we drive to extinction hundreds of species every single day. Every single day. Every year we see the transfer of wealth. This is the whole definition of civilization. We see the transfer of wealth from the poor to the wealthy at an accelerating rate. Things are getting better? Really? Maybe for a long time for relatively wealthy white men like me, things did get better. But for the rest of the world, things were getting worse. And certainly for the non-human species with which we share this most wondrous of planets, the world has been getting, uh, becoming a worse and worse place every single year. So what to do? Recognize two things, and, and we're complex enough organisms that we can hold two thoughts in our mind at the same time. And I get this from Derek Jensen, and, and I'm paraphrasing. One, life is really, really good. And acknowledge that, and live that, and, and be the absolute amazing human you are capable of being. That's one. Life is really, really wonderful. And two, things are really fucked up. And we're complex enough organisms, we can hold both of those ideas in our head. Things are really, really bad, especially for non-human species and for people who are not relatively wealthy white people. Things are really bad and they're getting worse. So what do we do about that? There's relatively little we can do to improve the macro situation. I, my whole life, every class I taught, I encourage people to not have children. Because at the root of many of our predicaments is human overpopulation. And I think I affected exactly, yeah, zero. Zero of my students actually went out there and lived my message. So I didn't change a thing and I was in a position of relative authority. Right? People in college sort of look up to college professors, if only because they need to suck up to get the grade. But then when they leave, when they walk away, they go and do their own thing. 
So I would encourage you, since you, uh, I don't think you're going to save the world, whatever that even means, that you be present with the ones you're with, that you enjoy every single moment and maybe even contribute to moments of joy. Basically, it won't be long until we have a nice free Arctic. At that point, I can't imagine we can avoid the 50 gigaton release of methane that Shikova warns is highly possible at any time. That's a direct quote. And so once we have a nice free Arctic, I just don't see how we can keep the methane monster under wraps. Uh, it's just difficult for me to imagine that that, that 50 gigaton burst wouldn't come forth in a relatively short period of time when that happens. And that obviously wouldn't contribute to even more rapid warming of the planet in, you know, we're, we're talking months or maybe years, not a long period of time in any event before we experience at the global level very rapid warming. So when Paul Beckwith talks about a five or six degree C temperature rise in a decade or two, this is the this is kind of event that we're talking about that could trigger that. And it's not it's not all that surprising when you consider that we now know, based on a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, that there was a fifty five million years ago there's a 5C warming at the global level over a span of 13 years. That's huge. The Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's five stages of, of grief, to which I've added a sixth, by the way. Um, the the five are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And I go in and out between those, as most people do when they experience grief. And when I was at the Earth at Risk conference. And I, I presented on my panel, and then award-winning journalist Dar Jamail presented right behind me, and he gave a, a five-minute synopsis, essentially, of the evidence that leads us to near-term human extinction. And then he spent the next five minutes talking about Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's five stages of grief. And, and as he was speaking, with his excellent sense of humor, and me with my twisted sense of humor, I realized there's a sixth in Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's Five Stages of Grief. There's gallows humor. And so this is beyond acceptance. And that's where I am most of the time today. Mm -hmm.